history. Romans chapter 1 and beginning in verse 14. Paul says, I am obligated both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks. Very interesting, but the, the word there is actually the barbarians. He said, I'm obligated to the Greeks and the barbarians. A barbarian was anyone who didn't know how to speak Greek. So if you don't know how to speak Greek, congratulations, you're a barbarian. I'm obligated both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That means the educated and the uneducated. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to the last, just as it is written, the righteous, or maybe your Bible says the just, it's the same word, the just or the righteous will live by faith. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to just understand this verse tonight. Lord, we thank you for this evening, and we thank you so much for our moms. Lord, thank you for the expression of your faithful, unconditional nurturing love that they are. Lord, I pray that you'd refresh our moms, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, Lord. I pray that you would just minister your strength, your encouragement to them. Lord, as they constantly pour out their love to us, I pray that you'd fill them up with your love. And Lord, I pray tonight that you'd speak to us out of your scripture, your holy word. Lord, we open our hearts to receive from you this evening. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen and amen. How powerful is the Word of God? Do you know that one line of Scripture is powerful enough to radically change a human heart? Do you know that one verse of Scripture is powerful enough to change the course of human history? And it did. There was once a brilliant young law student who was walking through a hayfield on a summer afternoon. And a thunderbolt struck the ground next to him and knocked him off of his feet. He was so shaken up by that experience that to his father's dismay, he became a Catholic monk. And not just any monk, he joined an extremely ascetic sect. He became the most ascetic monk of them all. He woke up every morning at 3 o'clock to pray and to repent for his sins. He whipped himself bloody. He starved himself half to death. He deprived himself of light and heat. He would sleep in the winter cold with no blankets on his bed. But all of his penance, all of his Efforts at self-vindication brought him no peace. In fact, he began to resent God, even to the point of blasphemy, he later said. In particular, he was haunted by the words of Romans chapter 1, verse 17. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. He understood those words to mean that God is righteous and we can never be. He understood those words to mean that God's righteousness is unattainable and therefore we are all doomed. This is what he wrote. I had been captivated with an extraordinary ardor for understanding Paul's epistle to the Romans. But a single word in chapter 1 verse 17 stood in my way in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. For I hated that word, the righteousness of God, which I had been taught to understand is the righteousness with which God punishes the unrighteous sinner. He visited the city of Rome, and as an act of devotion, he decided to climb the Scala Sancta. 
That is a set of white marble steps that leads to the private chapel of the early popes. According to church tradition, Jesus climbed these same steps on his way to Pilate's praetorium for trial. The steps were moved from Jerusalem to Rome in the 4th century by Emperor Constantine's mother. And while he was climbing up the steps on his knees and praying, a thought floated through his mind. It was the last line of Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The just, the righteous, shall live by faith. Or we could say it this way, the one who is justified by faith will live for eternity. Martin Luther later wrote that it was by the Spirit of God that he suddenly understood what those words meant. He immediately stopped his prayers, got up from his knees, and returned to his home in Wittenberg, Germany, where he began to write about the core doctrine of the Protestant Reformation, the just shall live by faith. Wars were fought over Martin Luther's revelation from Romans 1.17. Global empires rose and fell. Migration to the New World, the Americas, was driven by it. Missionaries were sent around the entire world because of it. What the Holy Spirit showed Martin Luther from Romans 1.17 has shaped the course of human history for the last 500 years right up to our day. It is literally the verse that changed history. So what is so powerful in this little verse? In Romans 1.17, Paul says that the gospel is powerful because in it the righteousness of God is revealed. What do those words mean? What is the righteousness of God and how does the gospel reveal it? Looking at Paul's words, I find three truths about the righteousness of God that I want to share with you quickly this evening. Three truths about the righteousness of God in Romans 1.17. The first truth is this. The righteousness of God means that God is right When he judges sinners. You know, one of the most common objections to the Christian God these days is the thought, how can a loving God send good people to hell? Have you ever had someone raise that objection to you? How how could a God, if he's loving and good, how could he send good people to hell? Perhaps it's an objection you've even stumbled over yourself. One way that the Old Testament describes God is that God is always in the right. Whatever God does, he is right. However God does things, he is right. Whenever and wherever and to whomever God does things, he is always right. If God blesses, he is right to do so. If God forgives, he is right to do so. If God judges, he is right to do so. God is never wrong, and he is incapable of doing anything wrong. We have a way we express that these days. We say, God is good. Oh, come on, you're a little slow. God is good. And all the time, God is good. David said, the Lord is Righteous in all his ways. In another place he said, as for God, his way is perfect. After God got done humiliating the Pharaoh of Egypt, Pharaoh finally admitted, Jehovah is in the right and I and my people are in the wrong. But you know, because of the legacy that was left to us by the serpent, We are all born struggling with this truth in our hearts. In the beginning, in the garden, the serpent sowed doubt into the hearts of Adam and Eve. He sowed mistrust and resentment toward God and estrangement from God. If God really loves you, why did he withhold the best fruit in the garden from you? 
If God really loves you, why would he deny you something that would bring you happiness? Why would he put restrictions and prohibitions on you? If God really loves you, why would he hold you back from becoming everything that you could be? The serpent sowed skepticism over God's judgment. He said, you shall become like God. You will not surely die. You know, maybe we could say that the original sin was really the sin of disbelief. And disbelief was followed by disobedience. Adam and Eve, they believed the serpent's lie and they doubted God. And ever since, mankind has wrestled with doubt over the goodness of God. We wonder if God really cares. We wonder if God is really fair. We wonder if we can really trust him. Whenever things go wrong, how many people immediately blame God? I had a tree limb fall on my car and crush the roof a number of years ago. When I called the insurance company, they said, that's an act of God. I said, no, God's a friend of mine. He wouldn't do that to me. But the gospel reveals That God is indeed righteous. God is always in the right and God always does what is right. The gospel reveals that God is righteous because he punishes sin. Perhaps it would help to mention that the word righteous and the word justice are one and the same word. God's righteousness is his justice. God's justice is his righteousness. God is righteous because he administers divine justice. In both testaments of the Bible, God's righteousness is linked with his judgment. David wrote, let the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. In Athens, Paul preached He will judge the world in righteousness. In Revelation, the angels shout, You are righteous, O Lord, because you have judged these things. True and righteous are your judgments. This sweet woman is a woman named Erin Von Schendel from the Kensington section of Brooklyn. She's 84 years old. She's a mother and a grandmother and a great-grandmother. A few weeks ago, she responded to a knock on her door, and when she opened it, a 250-pound monster pistol-whipped her in the face, broke her nose, and knocked her to the ground. He got away with nothing, as the poor woman had no money. Turns out that the perpetrator was responsible for a string of similar attacks across the Bronx and Brooklyn on elderly women, some in their 90s. You know, when we hear that, it stirs up inside of us a sense of righteous indignation, especially on Mother's Day. We feel compassion for an innocent, helpless victim. We feel contempt for a merciless violent coward preying on old women. We feel concern for other would-be victims. We don't want anyone else's mother or grandmother to suffer like that, possibly even be killed. When we hear that, something inside of us cries out for justice. And that gives us just a little earthly glimpse of the righteous indignation of a holy God over sin. God does not sin, and he cannot tolerate sin. God cannot leave sin unaddressed. Sin provokes God's righteous anger, and he must respond. It's right for God to punish sin. It would be unjust for God not to punish sin. In fact, I want to tell you, it would be unloving for God not to punish sin. It would be unloving towards the victims of sin. It would be unloving towards those who have avoided sin. Sin causes an outcry to heaven for divine justice. In Genesis chapter 18, God visits Abraham and he tells Abraham that there is an outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah that has reached his ears in heaven. What is the outcry? 
It's the cry of victims for divine justice. It's the cry of people who have been physically assaulted. It's the cry of people who have been sexually abused. It's the cry of young boys and young girls whose innocence was stolen from them. It's the cry of people who have been exploited, people who have been defrauded, people who have been betrayed, abandoned. It's the cry of babies whose lives have been extinguished in the womb. It's the cry of those who, whose lives have been taken in violence. You remember when Cain killed Abel, Abel's blood made a cry to heaven for justice. Abraham begged God to look again and see if there was any occasion for God to show mercy. But Abraham makes a confession of faith in God in Genesis 18. He says, the judge of all the earth will do right. The gospel reveals that God is righteous because God has not and will not leave human sin unaddressed. God has not swept the sins of mankind under the carpet. God has not winked, winked at sin. He hasn't been soft on sin. God hasn't pretended like nothing has happened and everything's all right. God punishes sins in the present and he will punish them ultimately in the future at the last judgment. Now, if that were all, that would be very bad news. Because Paul goes on from here to make an ironclad argument that we are all sinners without excuse and deserving of God's judgment. But the word gospel means good news. And the reason it's good news is because the gospel also reveals that God is right because he has made a way of escape from his punishment. Paul said that the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation. That word salvation means a rescue. Just like Israel was rescued from Egypt and later rescued from Babylon. You see, God is both holy and loving. And God is equally both. To say that God is love really only tells half of the story of God. For God is not only love, God is holy love. Because he is holy, he punishes sin. But because he is loving, he is gracious to sinners, and he has provided a means to rescue us from sin and from its punishment. The gospel reveals that God is righteous because he has been faithful to his creation. You know, one of the common indictments against God is that God created the world and then it fell into a mess and he has just left us alone in this mess. Therefore, he can't be good, as we say. But the gospel reveals that God has not left us alone in this mess. God has acted in the person of Jesus Christ and his cross and has made a way of escape for us. In Romans 3, Paul says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness so as to be just and to justify those who have faith in Jesus. God is righteous because he hasn't abandoned fallen mankind. He hasn't forsaken his broken creation. We should add here that the gospel is mainly the good news that God has rescued us from himself. God has rescued us from himself for himself. God has rescued us from his own wrath. And as much as we're thankful that God rescues us from ourselves and the mess that we make of our lives, and he truly does, the most important thing that the gospel reveals is that God rescues us from his own anger and judgment. Here's the key to understanding the whole letter of Romans. I hope maybe you're looking at Romans. I hope maybe you'll read along with us over these next several weeks as we look at this letter in detail. But here's the key to understanding the whole letter of Romans. The whole letter is a vindication of God's righteous dealings with mankind. Here's an outline of the book of Romans. God is righteous in judging the Gentiles. God is righteous in judging his own people, the Jews. God is righteous in providing a way of salvation through Jesus Christ. God is righteous when he calls unrighteous people righteous 
when they believe on Jesus. God is righteous in providing us with a means to live righteously via the Holy Spirit. God will yet be righteous by being faithful to Israel. And God will be glorified in the righteous lives of his people, his church. The whole message of the book of Romans is God is righteous. God is righteous. God is righteous. Three truths about the righteousness of God in Romans 1.17. The righteousness of God means that he's right when he judges sinners. And second, the righteousness of God means that God is a faithful promise keeper. In the Old Testament, God's righteousness is equated with his saving acts. Psalm 98 verse 2. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. Isaiah 46, verse 13. I'm bringing my righteousness near. It's not far away. And my salvation will not be delayed. God's righteousness is equated with his divine intervention in history to save his people. The gospel reveals that God has acted sequentially in history to save us. God's saving activity began in the very beginning. On the same day that Adam fell into sin. In the cool of the day, God came calling for Adam. And on that same day, God made a promise of a son who would be a savior. God promised that the serpent would bruise the son's heel, but the son would crush the serpent's head. God's saving activity continued with God's call and covenant with Abraham. The promise of a savior son began to take shape and the family that this savior son would come from was identified. God's saving activity continued with Isaac and Jacob and it was revealed that the savior son would come from the tribe of Judah. His saving activity continued with Moses and Joshua and Samuel and David and it was revealed that the savior son would come from the house of David. God's saving activity continued with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel and all the prophets and layer after layer after layer was added to the promise of a Savior Son. Somewhere between 350 and 400 prophecies made about Messiah. And not only did God add layers to the promise, but God divinely protected the promise bearers, the Jewish people. And God sovereignly set the world stage in history for the fulfillment of the promise. God has acted sequentially. And not only has he acted sequentially, but the gospel reveals that God has acted definitively in history to save us. The content of the gospel is Jesus Christ, the Savior Son whom God promised. Although he is God's son, he was born in a body of human flesh in the lineage of David. Although he is God's son, he died an ignominious death on a Roman cross and was buried in a tomb. But on the third day, he was raised again from the dead, proving him to be God's holy and powerful son. In particular, it's the details surrounding his death that has made our rescue possible. Paul says that his death was for us. That means it was in our place. He took upon himself the penalty for our sins. He was punished in our place. Paul says that his death was an atoning sacrifice through his blood. That means that Jesus' innocent blood was offered in payment to satisfy God's wrath over our sins. God is righteous because he kept his covenant promises and he sent his Savior Son. God is righteous because he himself paid the penalty that his righteous justice demanded. Well, I would look at, look at me for a minute. God willed that sin must be punished. But God also willed to bear the punishment himself. Those are the most wonderful words that you will ever hear. A righteous God must punish sin, but a righteous God bore the punishment himself. Three truths about the righteousness of God in Romans 1.17.
The righteousness of God means that he is right when he judges sinners. The righteousness of God means that he's a faithful promise keeper. And finally this, the righteousness of God means that God graciously gives to us what he demands from us. Worship team, you can come and help me. God graciously gives to us what he demands from us. I want to talk about that word revealed for a moment. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. You know that word revealed, it means it is manifested. It's it's an action word. It it means to, to make something happen. It means to bring something about. Beloved, listen, the gospel is a message that reveals divine truth about God and about His Son, Jesus. But listen, the gospel is not only information. The gospel actually causes something to happen. I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome that I might have a certain harvest among you. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is manifested. A righteousness that comes by faith. Beloved, look at me. The gospel is not only a message. The gospel is a divine moment. While the gospel is being shared, It brings about a divine moment of believing during which God's justice and His faithfulness are manifested in our presence and during which God's own righteousness is transferred onto us. That's precisely what happened to the Gentiles that were gathered in Cornelius' house in Acts 10. Peter came and he began to tell them the gospel. And while he was telling them the gospel, their hearts believed and the Holy Spirit came upon them. That's what happened to Lydia sitting on the riverbank. In Acts chapter 16, Paul found her praying to the Jewish God. Although she was a Gentile woman, her heart longed to know the Jewish God. And he began to tell her the good news that the Jewish Messiah came. And while he spoke to her, God enabled her to believe. In Romans 5.17, Paul says that God gives us the gift of his righteousness through faith in Jesus. This is the truth that Martin Luther realized on his knees on the steps of the Scala Sancta. He realized that God bestows his own righteousness on those who believe in Jesus. The righteousness of God is righteousness from God. And it's opposed to self-righteousness. It's opposed to, to our own efforts to try and please God through religion or through trying to be good. Because of the cross, God can call sinners righteous without compromising His own righteousness. You know, normally it would be unjust to call a guilty man innocent. In fact, God says that's an abomination in his word. But God has allowed for a principle of substitution. God has allowed for the blood of an innocent sacrifice to cover for and to spare the life of a guilty person. On the cross, Jesus was our substitute. Our sins and the punishment they deserve were transferred onto him. And in turn... In in their place, Jesus' righteousness and all the heavenly rewards that it deserves is transferred onto us when we believe on Him. The word for this is justified. Although I am a sinner, look at me, although I am a sinner, when God looks at me, He sees me just as if I'd never sinned. Paul wrote, we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. 
And the way we receive this gift of righteousness is to embrace it by faith. If you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Adam's original sin was rooted in doubt. Adam's original sin was rooted in mistrust of God. Adam's original sin was rooted in the belief that he could do it his own way rather than submitting to God's way. And the way we escape sin is by reversing the disbelief. The way we escape sin is by believing God. It's by trusting God. The way we escape sin is by believing that our way isn't working and that God's way is the only way. In Romans 3, Paul writes, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by good works. Rather, through the law we became conscious of our sin, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. There's that word again. To which the law and prophets testify, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's one more encouraging word that I want to share with you this evening, and then we're done. And moms, I want you to especially be encouraged by this word this evening. The gospel is the good news that God will continue to graciously give us what he demands from us day by day by day. All of these words in Romans 1, 16 and 17 they are all in a verbal tense that is continuous. What that means is it just keeps going and going and going and going. I am continuously not ashamed of the gospel for it is continuously the power of God that continuously brings salvation to everyone who continues to believe. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is continuously manifested. A righteousness that is continuously by faith, from faith, from the beginning to the last. Just as it is written, the one who is continuously by faith made righteous shall continuously live. So what's the good news? The good news is that everything that God demands from us, God will graciously continue to give to us day by day by day as we simply continue to trust in Him. Somebody take a hold of that word this evening. What God has told you to do in His Word, what God demands of you in His Word, God is so faithful and gracious to give you day after day after day. Wives and moms, that description of a virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, the descriptions of godly wives and mothers in Ephesians 5 and in 1 Timothy and 1 Peter, the examples of Jochebed and Miriam and Deborah and Hannah and Ruth and all the women in Scripture. God will graciously give to you everything you need to fulfill that day by day by day dads and husbands, God will graciously give you everything you need to live like his word demands and describes day by day by day. By the way, did it ever occur to you that there's only one chapter in the book of Proverbs that tells women how to be wise, but there are 30 chapters that tell men how to be wise. I'm just saying, I, I'm just saying, you know, that guys needed 30 chapters, women just needed one at the end. Senior adults, single adults, single again adults, young adults, students, everything that God demands from you, God graciously gives to you day by day by day as you trust in Him. What is the meaning of this verse that changed modern history? What is the righteousness of God? It means that the righteous God has acted righteously in history in order to give the gift of his own righteousness to you and to me. And he keeps on giving and giving and giving what he demands from us day by day by day. Now that is truly good news.
I close with this. Martin Luther wrote about the moment that he believed on the steps of the Scala Sancta. He said, at last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the content of the words, namely, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is manifested as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is righteousness with which a merciful God justifies us by faith. Listen, here I felt altogether that I was born again and that I had entered paradise itself through open gates. I pray today that that will be your experience too. I pray that the verse that changed the course of modern history will change your heart too. And I pray that you will believe and that believing you'll have life in his name. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place this evening? Come on.